how do you make comics without all the frustration, without feeling lousy and inadequate all the time? Join me, Jess Rolofson, and me, Tom Hart, on The Terrible Anvil. Each week, we build community and shift our mindset about what it means to make comics and art. We're working through the whole process, one piece at a time, turning our suffering and angst into fun and glee. Join us at sawcomics.org. We're ready. <laughs> We're ready. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, how do we start? Um, I'm Tom Hart. This is Sequential Artist Workshop. My name is Jess Rulofson. I'm also with the Sequential Artist Workshop. And we'll and probably have a <laughs> proper intro later or something. Um, uh, welcome to everybody uh, at SAW who uh, are attending. Um, what's going on is that Jess and I love talking about um, comics, but more importantly, we love talking about the process of making them. And even more importantly, we love to talk about uh, the feelings that arise while, during the process of making them. So, and uh, um, so th that's that's what this is. Um, it's also, and especially actually, uh, a, a chance for, um, uh, I've asked Jess to write a book, which is she's already written basically, but we're just organizing it or something, right? And that that is going to be called The Bootlegger's Guide to Comics. And I'll let you talk about that later. Anyway, so we're here just to talk about comics process and what the heck goes on when you're trying to make one and why it feels so lousy, I guess. And um, we've asked for some questions prior to this in, in, the, in our network. And also we're inviting people to ask questions in the chat. So that's my introduction. Jess, what did I miss and and how do how do we how do we go from here? Um, I think you touched on the major points. Uh, it, everything Tom said is true, and I'm including a link in the chat to um, the most recent post that sort of summarizes some of the uh, questions or comments we got in answer to our question for the very first terrible anvil episode. What part of comics is the hardest? Uh, and surprisingly no one said all of it <laughs> someone was like I actually like all of it it's xyz that's tricky so uh each week we try to pick on a theme that is already sort of somewhat existing in the book so we already kind of have some topics in mind and then hopefully uh, uh tom or i will like kind of follow up on the network to get more pointed um questions from the audience so like tom said there's different ways to participate you can um, throw comments in the chat if you're available to attend a podcast in real time. Um, but if you're not, you can always throw in um, questions if you're part of the Flow Network uh, on the Sequential Artist Workshop Mighty Network. So, um, so we wanted to just. Well, I'm not sure what we wanted. You always have. I think. I feel like. I I sort of ask around for what the heck we're talking about, and then you just sort of nail it a lot of times. So um, are we talking about the broader picture? Like, why do we make comics? Or are we talk? what should we be talking about today? Well, uh, I'm glad you brought up like feelings earlier, because <laughs> it's not something that like, I feel like it sounds very professional. <laughs> uh, like you want to keep your feelings to yourself as a professional cartoonist in a way, but it's so funny because a lot of comics uh, kind of deal explicitly with uh, unpacking some of the stuff for the reader. Um, so I think in thinking about what what part of comics is the hardest, it is, I, I do think the structure of it is like we kind of take a big view and then go uh, more specific, but, um, but I hesitate to like throw my preconceived structure on, <laughs> on what we might talk about. Should we just go down the list? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So, and I was also trying to look to see if maybe people had the same question. Um, a few of us think that the hardest thing is drawing. <laughs> How do you feel about that, Tom? <laughs> is drawing really, really hard? Heavy sigh, radio silence. Um, <laughs> drawing. <laughs> um... I, I might take a pass on that question. Yeah, I mean, I find drawing very hard. I was never a natural at it, and it was, and it's always the most difficult. But again, it's not quote the drawing; 
-hmm. it's it's the drawing to match my expectations you know yeah like I kind of like drawing but it's when I expect something out of it and that I don't like it so that's what I got yeah that's super good and I, I'm glad you said it that way because I feel like this is going to tie into a later question that's on the list uh that I was thinking about expectation <laughs> there's that meme that's like uh how it started and how it's going and <laughs> it feels like that where oh this is gonna be great and then you're like what's happening <laughs> yeah drawing for me also um that's sort of been a big part of the bootlegger idea I guess like and someone on, in the comments was like what is what is bootleggers what does this mean bootleggers guide and it's hard for me to enunciate and say that correctly. It sounds like I'm saying I'm going to lick your boots. <laughs> but it means like, what's like the, and Tom kind of paraphrased, he's like, what's the like illegal version of this? And I, I was thinking on the way to the library, there, a, a public bus went by and it said, uh, get your degree in as little as X, Y, Z months in like uh, healthcare, <laughs> which I shouldn't laugh, but my husband's a nurse. So I was like, oh, that will go really well. But I, I think there's this idea of uh, licensure, like. When I do XYZ, I'll become an official bona fide cartoonist and sort of um, sweetly and mildly sort of jokey, but sort of serious. Uh, Saw sends out your real cartoonist cards to some of our year long. I think it's a year long program, isn't it, Tom? It's, uh, um, I can't. I think it's a graphic novel program, actually. Maybe it's a graphic novel program. So we have a graphic novel intensive program that lasts six months from June to November and uh, and I think at the start of the program, if you sign up and you give us your mailing address, we won't spam you, but we send you a card that says you're a real card carrying cartoonist now, you're bona fide, um, kind of before you begin the work, which is sort of amazing. So I think we've internalized this idea of like, I have to do X, Y, Z to be real. And I think that's a big reason why I uh, went and got my master's in creative writing, because I'm like, I'm not a real writer until I get this. And I don't feel like a real writer still, but I have a degree and I could probably shrink it down and laminate it and carry it around. But um, yeah, so so like, I think a difficulty that's tied into the expectations, right? Like uh, a real cartoonist does X, Y, Z. And we know we have our taste, like maybe we're comparing ourselves to other cartoonists. Um, right. But a lot of it, I think, is a comparison to the beautiful vision that's in our head. And then we're like, wait, this doesn't, right. this doesn't look like the photo from the recipe book. <laughs> <laughs> or it doesn't look like all the books at Barnes and Noble or, or whatever. Yeah. It doesn't look like any book ever before. And I think that's, I think we can leverage the things that are weird. Uh, and that, that might be the good part is the part that doesn't look like anything else. But it's uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> leverage the things that are weird. Every once in a while, I start writing down Jessism. So that's going to be my first thing. Yeah, but Tom sounds like he's going into a trance. It's just because he's <laughs> writing down something I said. He found a note the other day that said, ideas are like frogs. And he's like, what does that mean? And I was like, I don't remember. I was like, I think it means that they're slippery. That they kind of hop away. Like oh. they out of frogs all over the table. Those are I, ideas. I do think that's what that was. I, I want to draw like... that now. <laughs> all right, so... So you don't need a license to make comics. No. Um, you don't need a license to draw or write or anything, right? But we've we've internalized, and maybe it's just us who have some foot in the late 20th century <laughs> that that feel that way. Um, maybe it's not, I don't know. But but you don't need a license. And you also you don't need a license to to put it out there. You don't need a license to say it's done. You don't need a license to say, I like it anyway. I don't know. It's just, it's so surprising to me because I certainly grew up thinking like there was a society that you might be led into eventually. In fact, it's called the National Cartoonist Society, you know, <laughs> which I was never. Are you a member? Can we no. start our own like group and be like, give everyone permission I, to join? <laughs> no, start our own. We start our own, started our own group here. So yeah. So what's what's next if we've covered that topic? Well, well, so it's all kind of related. Uh, so the idea of like gatekeeping, and maybe we could revisit drawing again because I feel like sometimes we're like, ha 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 ha. It's this is an easy answer. I think drawing is always going to be hard, and um, you have to hold hands with the hard parts and be like, we're going together, you and I. This thing I don't like, and I'm going to uh, extract your way out of it, hopefully. And there are different ways to do that, but some of the other things that people are talking about, um, Uli and also Sarah had 
mentioned, uh, Uli says it like this, the hardest part of making comics is convincing people that the thing you want to tell is worth telling. So first identifying who the people are, I think in this context, Uli's been um, putting their work out there for um, grants and, and getting some type of funding. So we wanna be acknowledged for the geniuses that we are by society of large, whoever wants to give us praise, that's good. But also money is really nice. So like, how do I keep this thing going and, and keep it uh, being funded? So I think there's a foot in reality there. It's not just an ego thing. And then Sarah had said, um, again, the worst part is drawing, <laughs> but also uh, feeling driven to tell these stories that I'm not sure people really want to hear. So identifying who the people are, like, who do you think doesn't want want to hear it and what about it don't they want to hear I think these things are related to our discomfort with like what our vision is versus what it looks like on paper in that first draft oh okay um I'm uh I've got two random comments maybe you can you can riff on that and one is that first of all I love that you you said something like who are these people that don't want to hear it right I like a lot of times you you hear people say identify who your audience is you know or or who your the people are and it's interesting to say to ask who who are these people you don't think you know don't want to hear your ideas and and then i guess the next step is figure out how to ignore them right and and then and then find the people that do and and again i i not to not to toot the horn of saw too much but that's one thing i i think we've created here which is an audience um, of like-minded people who want to read each other's stories. And, and that I, I often point to that when that question comes up, it's like, who wants to read it? It's like, I do. So-and-so over there does, so-and-so over there does. And, and believe me, I know from, from firsthand experience, like, you know, uh, less than five readers who read it closely, it means so much, <laughs> it feels so good, you know? Uh, but I, I also, I also wanted to comment that uh, on the reality part of it, you know, Austin Cleon, who is a great creator and a great advocate for everybody being an artist, but he also, he's a bit of a, um, he has a bit of a slightly antagonistic attitude towards the idea of monetizing everything. And he says like, um, you know, as soon as you make something, you make a, you know, you, you make a mug, oh, you know, I've got it blurred, or you write a poem or something, you know, somebody says, oh, you should have an Etsy store, you should, <laughs> you, you know, you should, and then immediately it becomes like, how can I monetize it? And he says, yeah, do some things for love. And, um, you know, I don't know if Saw is that space, or maybe we're both spaces, because we do sort of help people, like, we'll help you get published and, and find the broadest audience you can, but we're also like, or at least I am, I'm like, don't worry about it, just do it for love. <laughs> anyway, um, I I think my purpose, at least in this in this dialogue, is to encourage people to find the part of it that they like to do. Um, so I don't know if I made a big tangle out of your thoughts there or not. No, I think that's really good. And I'm riffing on your riff. I feel like we're like a very cool jazz duo right now. <laughs> yeah, um, I was. When I is gonna land and get back into a back into a groove though is the question. Like, yeah, I know. Cool. We're we're like we're just freestyling right now. We're warming up. Uh, is this thing on? Are we recording? Um, <laughs> thanks for being here, everybody. Um, so when Tom was talking, I, I wrote down um how to cherish without monetization. <laughs> So it's like, uh, so sometimes I'll say something out loud. Our The way our apartment's set up, um, it's really long and the rooms coming off of other rooms because it's it's a chunk of a bottom part of a house and it doesn't make any sense. And it was probably built a hundred years ago. And my husband and I are never in the same room, <laughs> but we have conversations at great length. And we're like, where are you? And so I'll just shout something and he'd be like, that's really good. That's really, really good. You should write that, write that down. And we have a little tiny book we're calling the bean book because we refer to thoughts as beans. We call them bean thoughts. I don't, it's very silly, but he's like, write it in the bean book with this idea that like later we'll look at it and find a way to monetize it. And we'll be like world famous comedians or cartoonists. I don't know. I don't know what we're doing with the bean book, but, um, but there is a, a, an acknowledgement in that moment of like, wow, that's so good. You should write it down, which is also why I hang out with Tom <laughs> virtually as often as possible. Because I guess I just, all my friends, if you write down something I say, I'd be like, oh, I'm just keeping them forever. I love them. But, uh, but, but I think that's tied into like an acknowledgement of the good of, of the idea itself and being excited about it and tucking it away and then figuring out why you like that 
and making sure you keep having a conversation with yourself about like why you like that versus why will my audience like that? I think if you're just really obsessed with something and then you go over to somebody start talking about whatever Wikipedia wormhole you just fell down, like some of that's contagious. Like I, I think there's, I think if whatever's hypnotizing us, once we start talking about it, some of that stuff is like hard to deny if you get it in front of people who understand what it is you're trying to say. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So be hypnotized by your own idea. And... Yeah. Without being like, well, I don't know. It's it's hard when you make stuff because you do want to have one foot in reality because you do want to connect with people, but, um, but you also have to give yourself enough space to love what you love and, and make what you make and then worry about how many, it's it's like uh, writing a letter before you know who you're sending it to. <laughs> you've got to, uh, you've got the stamp on it and you're like, okay, I got to get, I got to get this in the mail now that I've finished it. But you're like, well, who is this for? So it's always a hard question to ask. Do you write the question, who is this for before mm -hmm. you start writing or after you write your letter? Like it's a little tricky, um, but I think we do have an audience in mind. Maybe our first audience is ourself or our internal critic or the good guy, whatever the opposite of the internal critic is. Uh, I don't know. Um, but I was curious about um, what Sarah was asking about, like, who doesn't want to hear this? Like, um, how do I get over? And there's also a, kind of an aspect of gatekeeping there. Like, that's a real thing. Like, only certain things get published. You know, you have to be a certain level of crazy slash affluent to spend some of your time making something that doesn't make any money while you're making it. Um, so there's there's certainly like built-in structures that are hard and we push against those things. Um, um, but I was thinking, I, I well, this is, this is the paraphrase of Sarah's full comment. So for me, the worst part is drawing, but also feeling driven to tell stories that I'm not sure people really want to hear. So then I end up in a morass of despair a classic location for cartoonists, the morass of despair, because I feel like I must do this. But then because I'm not sure anyone really wants to hear what I have to say, I also feel cringy and vulnerable. So there's this like state of, Ugh. um, so my immediate response to Sarah that I wrote to myself was imagine a version that could be worse. <laughs> like, I think in our head, we're like, oh, this is really bad. But I'm like, invite yourself to picture a version that's even worse, like explicitly something you would never do, like um, sexist or racist or backwards or uh, just something that's against what you stand for, right? Like that, those are good, clear examples, um, unless you're really <laughs> into those things. You mean an example of that idea or that, that the project that she wants to make? Well, I don't know. Like, I think it comes up a lot with graphic memoir, uh, particularly stuff that's... Um, maybe trauma-based or um, hyper-specific. I, 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 when I was interviewing veterans, a lot of them were like happy to talk about their experiences, but would hesitate to do it in a comparative way. And if they did, they would say, uh, someone always had it worse. So why would I, why would I frame this in a context of like suffering at all? I just need to get over it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think some of that's coming to play, but I don't know if there's like a specific thing. Um, I, I don't think we do. I don't think we're the same line of thought when we're making like a batch of cookies. We're like, everybody loves, loves cookies. I'll eat them if no one else eats them. <laughs> like, uh, but we're not like, oh, who's going to read this? And uh, will anyone like it? But I like the idea of like thinking about a worse version. The other thing, maybe not the content. So let's say maybe not a racist version. That's a really weird, terrible example. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but think about artists that you don't like that are out there making money and publishing stuff I don't know some of these people I don't know the talent is really a thing that's you know you're more talented than xyz you can tell yourself whoever whoever your like artistic nemesis is I know none of this is healthy <laughs> you okay. have to peer review this with your therapist but um, but you could tell yourself, at least I'm not that guy, or that guy made XYZ. Think of the worst movie you've ever seen. That exists. People paid to watch it. Did they pay money to make it? And it happened. Like you you can make things happen. Um, there's also people tell us stuff all the time that we're not interested in hearing. This is a hyper specific, again, I, I don't mean to trash anybody, but a hyper specific cultural example that probably won't age really well. But right now, Will Smith's wife, Jada Pinkett Smith, 
has made a career out of talking about how terrible her marriage is and remains married to Will Smith, but she talks about it all the time. No one asked, but she still talks about it. So I do think there's an audience, even when there's not an audience, and people are talking about how much they don't want to hear about it. So it's become this weird conversation. Uh -huh. um, and like, so picture a version of your story that's is it stupid? Is it self-indulgent? Is it gross? Is it terrifying? All those types of stories are floating out there waiting for your terrible story to join the party. <laughs> but more likely, your story is not perceived as cringy by the reader and your your reader, the reader you're looking for, is out there waiting for your story so that it can spark a light in them and that they're not alone in the darkness. That's something I believe. For example, Sarah is weird too. <laughs> So I am okay. Uh, so at the least, you could be an example for future cartoonists on what not to do. That's my goal. <laughs> it's like I'll go down as a textbook example of how not to letter something. I would love to do that. Um, if not in a famous textbook, then in the bootlegger's guide, I could show you how not to do stuff. But if you're feeling driven to do something and to tell a particular story, it must mean that there is some value in it. But that value might not be what we think it is at first or match exactly what, what we want it to be. But that can be a good thing. Like, I think it's a lot bigger than we're giving ourselves credit for. So I don't think it's our ju job to judge um, what the audience wants to hear. And, and then I wrote, you're not a cover band at a wedding. You're Patti Smith howling into the night. <laughs> Oh, so, uh, and I don't even like Patty Smith that much. Like I love her, but I like I know people like really, really love her. But she's a great example because she like she wasn't like I hope people like my music. She's like ah, <laughs> and she's amazing. You're not a cover band at a wedding. You're howling into the night. I wrote. Um, <clears throat> there was so much there, Jess. Um, and I wrote it down. Part of it was scripted because I was like, ah, it, okay, I'm good. So excited well, by Sarah's question. Well, We'll need that later. And Donna in the chat says the same thing. Everyone has an audience. You're you're not making something for everyone. You're making something for the audience who likes the kind of stuff you make, and who's already looking for more of the kind of stuff you make. Well, that's interesting. More of the kind of stuff. Because sometimes, sometimes that that's interesting that to me, that more word there. Cause sometimes we think like we're gonna reach somebody with this thing they've never seen before and it's totally new. Um but Donna's saying. No, they want more, <laughs> more of what they're they're already getting, and you just are part of that pipeline or something. I'm not really sure. Well, and there are, I think there are audience demands, but if if you can't go to a bakery and buy a screwdriver, like I'm the bakery, I'm not the tool store. Like I, I think you can be good at what you're good at and be as specific as you want to be. But that goes down to, and again, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my bias as 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 somebody who doesn't. Um, shoot for the moon anymore when it comes to audience. I love your cookies analogy, right? You know, we bake cookies not not too concerned with is everybody going to eat them? And I forget exactly what you wrote. And like, you know, we do it because the act of baking cookies is nice and, and the act of eating a couple of them is nice and the act of sharing it with the handful of people that we'll share them with is really wonderful. And um, I agree that art can be the same thing. And um, that's why I, I encourage so many people to do diary comics these days or just small things. That's why some of our programs here at SAW, even the peer begun ones, like like uh, the Wednesday workshop, the um, that's why that works so well. Uh, that's where people get together and they do drawing prompts and then, and then they call it a day and they just have this great time. There's a lot of laughter. There's a lot of joy. Um, a lot of times, a lot of times, sometimes, what happens is is we start to feel like okay but now i got to make a big thing that shatters the world and makes everybody really impressed with me or something that's where that can get kind of troubling but the sad thing is there are people who can do that who <laughs> you know if so and so gets the idea to make a 600 page graphic novel that's going to blow everybody away eventually they do it you know somebody like but, but i think also yeah like like there are things that exist out there that are amazing where we read yeah. and we're like, how am I ever going to make anything that's that amazing? Or like, I love that so much. And my abilities are different <laughs> from what, what I'm experiencing this, this other piece of art in the world as it. Um, I, I think it's, it's good to like, look at a lot of different things that are good and bad and things that you like and things that you, you don't like and, and see uh, just it's, 
the things that exist out, outside of your creative space are polished, finished, produced type of things that probably had more than one person on board. So I think sometimes there's like this unfair comparison. Um, but that is something that helped me with my graphic novel, like thinking, even if I make this badly, I don't think anyone else is going to make a graphic novel about veterans. Like no one's made it yet. I didn't see a book like mine out in the universe. So I was like, isn't that enough reason to make it? Even if I do the crappiest job, <laughs> like, uh, and then if anyone says, man, you did a really bad job. I'm like, where's yours? I didn't see yours. So I made one. Like, I mean, if you're not bringing cookies to the break room, you're going to have to eat mine. <laughs> so but, I don't know. But let's, let's interrogate that a little bit. And I, and I admit, I sometimes play devil's advocate a little too much, but, but what if there were a handful of books like yours out there? Yours would still be valid, right? And it, yours would still be uniquely you. And I think it would be uniquely filtered through your, your line of questioning and your, your, visual, your visualization, because these are visual works, and, um, and your own personal story, you know? And so I think yeah. there's validity to all of it. And there are other genres, I won't get specific, but there are other genres where there is a lot of overlap. I don't even mean, I mean nonfiction genres. <clears throat> and, um, and the uniqueness, there's always something unique about the work. But again, we're, I, I'm also talking about bookstore books. So I'd rather, and after this, I'll talk about mini comics and things, but go ahead, sorry. Even even if like uh, let's say there was a book that was very similar to mine existing in the world, uh, interviews with veterans, and it was a graphic novel, even because um, I do think books like that exist that aren't in graphic form. But let's say it came out, I'm still in the process of making mine, so mine's a product of its of the time it's made in itself, and and the person who's making it, like I'm not enlisted, I'm like on the youngish side of the spectrum creeping towards the older side of the spectrum and I'm a lady like I, I have my own sensibilities so I, I do agree with what Tom's saying that um, you bring your own unique vision to the work itself and I think it's a good thing if there's a lot of books that kind of exist sort of like yours um, because then it's easier to pitch it to a publisher you're like look at all these fabulous books that are like mine but but they're not exactly like mine there's I'm doing something different here like they, it's just context. Like, I, I think it's good if there are things that exist that are like yours, so you can put it um, next to the other books on the bookshelf, I guess. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, again, uh, part of the focus right now that you and I are, are on is books and bookstores, right? And that And that is a very specific series of variables. And you are going to run into, let's continue the idea of book a book like yours you are going to run into publishers if there were five or six books like that where a publisher says we already have a veterans book we don't need a veterans book you know that definitely happens i've seen it many times you know there are certain slots that publishers want to fill or can fill and then when it gets filled they don't they don't keep looking um but again i me personally if it's about art and it's about the making of the thing and it's about the feelings about the making of the thing i don't want to talk about big publishers at all <laughs> like I want to talk about, I want to talk about the communities we exist in, you know, like we're so hyper-connected, right? You know, even 20, 30 years ago, you wouldn't have access to this many stories. Like if you were doing like, like, um, all right, Harry Potter is 20th, 21st century mostly. So let's look at Lord of the Rings. If you were doing Lord of the Rings fan fiction in the 1980s, you would share it with your high school friends or college. Um, you would go to a Lord of the Rings convention and you'd all love each other and you'd all share it and it'd be great and you'd feel great and you'd go home and you'd make another one. You wouldn't realize there are 10,000 other people doing it. <laughs> you'd think there were a couple dozen or a couple hundred and you'd be really happy to know them. But now we're so inundated with everybody's story and it's hard to push, it's hard to like, feel that as a flood and push back on it and be like, well, you know, I'm just one person. There's thousands of stories coming at me. What does my story matter? And then, and then you feel like Sarah does like, this is just, uh, th this doesn't matter. No one's going to want to read it. And I'm just going to feel cringy for actually telling what I feel. And that to me, the step we need to, at least for my particular disposition, I need to like block out most every other most other stories right so like i don't you know i, I don't go on social media i i 
I try and only read the books that like three or four people have told me to read. You know, it's like if enough people say read this book, it's really good. But otherwise, I won't go see seeking them because I want to I want to save some space to be awed and to enjoy and even adore some of the work that comes my way from the people that that I'm really close to here at Saw, especially. Um, so anyway, that's what I'm trying to say is that to me, the, the inundation of stories makes feeling bad about our story pretty easy. <laughs> I like the idea of like intentionally being out of the loop too. Like part of me is just affirming my laziness, but I am like particularly ill-read, which is funny because I teach a class in real life on the graphic novel. <laughs> Basically, I trick my students into telling me what to put on the syllabus for the next semester. <laughs> and then I read right. those. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think there are books like, okay, I should probably read XYZ because it's critically acclaimed. So I do try to read a little bit, but um, I'm really bad about just looking at the pictures in a graphic novel and being like, oh yeah, yeah, I, I know I know what that is. But uh, but yeah, I, like, I feel like I make better work when I'm not reading anything and I'm not watching any movies or even listening to music. And I'm just like, what about this? And it, yeah. it can at least convince me that um, no one's ever had that weird idea before. I don't know if originality is necessarily the primary concern of um, an, in, an, like an inner critic, like, oh, like, will this matter to an audience if it's never been said before or is particularly impressive? The, the other side of that is like, is this just going to be so irritating or stupid or weird that no one wants to like it or no one will even give me the time to read it? And maybe they'll even like come after me <laughs> with weapons. Like maybe this could go really, really bad. I did kind of think that when I made the graphic novel, I was like, I can't interview every veteran ever and these are really specific experiences and i don't know if i'm even drawing these uniforms correctly i thought for the longest time marines and um, people in the army had the same <laughs> outfits because yeah. it's all just like it's got pockets it's a name tape it's the same right oh my goodness when i first drew like uh tom and i worked on a, a book uh, about the odyssey that was sort of uh projected onto present day and the, some of the main characters were marines and this is where I learned that the Marines hats are completely different. They have like actual points. But if you glanced at it really fast, you'd be like, that looks like the, the hats that they wear in the Air Force or the Army, the basic fatigues, but they're completely different. Anyway, the the field is was ripe for mistakes. <laughs> like I was like, there's no way I'm not going to screw this up. But then because it was so expansive, I was like, I'm just going to have to do it and do the weird wrong version because I do think it's important. And then the idea maybe I, it was a lie I told myself, but I was like, I think this is going to be valuable, valuable to veterans or anybody who's like getting out of one situation and, and trying to reinvent themselves to, to do the rest of their life. Like they've just gotten out of a divorce, but most of the people that I interviewed had just gotten out of the military and talked about what they did next as, as integrating in, as a civilian. And I kind of had a similar experience, not quite to that degree or those stakes, uh, getting out of college. <laughs> Like the economy crashed in 2008 and I was like, I'm going to make uh, illustration and get a lot of money for that. And that's not what happened. But um, I, I think it was nice to just hear a similar story. So so sometimes when you chase after something specific, hopefully something universal is in there, too. So like I, I do think even though the graphic novel I worked on was for a particular type of veteran it was the ideal audience, I guess. I hope that anybody that read it might enjoy it and, and might get something out of it or think just be enlightened in some way. But um, yeah, I don't know if like you're responsible for like, like we don't have to write like satisfaction guaranteed <laughs> in front of our graphic novels. I don't know how responsible we are for that, but I do think it's good to have a conversation with yourself while you're making the work for like who you're most tender audiences like who who would be happy to hear from you who would be happy to get your letter in the mail um i want to go back to something you said in in all of that which is the um which is about the inner critic and originality originality not necessarily being like the purview of the inner critic like they don't necessarily want you to be super unique right because that's weird and you'd be an outcast but um but they want you so they 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 want you just like a little bit unique, right? Just unique unique enough to feel special, I guess. Yeah. And but I think I I mean I think the problem is, I, yeah I don't know that it that's a that's a tough one to to untangle because um you know I really feel that like belonging is one of the things we 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 strive for the most in the world I I, I think except some people who 
maybe strive for supremacy, but I think most people strive for belonging. And, um, and so those, those, th those things you identify in the inner critic are, um, uh, are very pronounced there, right? We're trying to belong to this group of people that share experiences or at least share beliefs and, and value systems and stuff. And we want to contribute something of value. So it needs to be a little bit unique, right? But I think the problem that what happens when when we're telling our story is we just start to think we're too we're we're not just a little bit unique. We're totally weird and wrong <laughs> and we don't belong, right? And so what do you do with that? Uh, I'm trying to write, worried we're uh, not unique, but totally weird. Oh no. <laughs> uh, I if I'm being honest, I would say that's probably why interview people like the project I'm working on now um my husband writes it from the perspective of his lived experience as a, a nurse in the ICU so I'm like he's he I'm just I'm just drawing the pictures that's what he said and it was kind of the same thing with the veterans like oh I'll just interview them so I'm off the hook I don't have to tell my own story and um if they're lying <laughs> or their memory is not serving them as best as I think it is it's not my fault because like this is just oral history so um I think there is some avoidance of that uh, being weird. I was like, oh, but that's what that guy said. It's, it's like, <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> sure. so, but I also wonder, like I, I've been working on a, an outline for a novel for a while and I've really had just a major struggle with even writing it. And I wonder if that's part of it, if I'm afraid it's, it's too weird or I'm too weird. Yeah, well, I mean, it's two things. It's weird and also not good, right? Yeah, weird is not good, right? Like smelly, like, mm, not good. Well, but, um, but also like there's there there's the aesthetic value, right? I don't draw the right way. I don't draw good. Um, I don't know. How do, okay, should we go down and the I list? Wonder why, well, I, like, I wonder why not, uh, not being good is bad. Like, why are we afraid of not being good? Well, yeah, again, I think I think that's a major cultural shift that's happening where people are saying it doesn't matter. Just do it anyway. Yeah. yeah. Which is different from the like evolutionary biology people that are like, since the dawn of man, people threw rocks at weirdos and don't do that. Otherwise <laughs> the group will chase you from the cave and you will be out on your own. So like there's validity to it. I'm like, why are we so afraid of it? I'm not trying to discount it. I'm just like, why why am I so scared of my novel? So I'm really asking. <laughs> I have I have a thought about that too. That maybe it's relevant. Why is just hang on? Let me type this. Why is just so scared of her novel? The one thing again, I want to bring it back to the feelings. Um, I realized that one thing we're really worried about. I'm I certainly am speaking from firsthand experience. Is that um, the anxiety of everyday life, the the sort of like hustle to just sort of do my daily life um, and how much I don't like it, right? That frustration, that's re like all of that equals frustration for me. But in some ways that feeling is better than the feeling of knowing I have an hour of free time to do art and then I do it badly. Hmm. Like, like that is a worse feeling than just the, chronic frustration of my daily life but the but the key word there i think is badly right you know i don't i don't need to be judging it i'm judging it the wrong way if i'm spending an hour making art and i'm feeling bad about it um and that's one reason i stopped making comics when i started taking this is also <laughs> hilarious like okay top secret info for uh for our listeners and our attendees Tom and I don't make art. We, we both like silently quit making drawings and we're like, this is how you get over it. And we're like quietly, uh, Tom's making music and I'm staring out the window. <laughs> but like, it's not over till it's over. I mean, this is part of the process. So don't give up on us. Um, oh, for sure. And and I don't, I, I don't want to talk about myself too much, but I will say that <laughs> what I've been doing, like I've been teaching myself music for nine months or something. And what I've been doing, I, I can tell, is training my brain to care less about the outcome and enjoy the process more. And when I go back into comics, which hopefully will happen soon, maybe, um, I'm, I, I, I've got, I think I've got my brain primed a little bit better to be like, this is just play, you know? And you've got skills and you've got ideas and you've got things like that that you've developed over time. But now you, it's okay to just sort of 
play with them and um and let things come out and um for me personally coming up with the idea beforehand and then like sort of executing it is the worst like there are people who do that i just i heard a podcast with dan Klaus where he said and he's a great writer but he said i wish i just wish somebody would just give me 500 pages of script to draw and i would just be happy to draw them i'd be like that's crazy i look at one page of script i drew and i'm like oh why did i have myself draw a car axle on this panel you know <laughs> like oh what an idiot who wrote this you know so um so everybody's got to find the, the rhythm with that and so i'm i'm looking for that joy again and that joy involves a little less um a little a little less puffery about the idea beforehand that's tricky when because we get we have a lot of memoirists here and that that's tricky because a lot of when we're working on memoir a lot of that is about like i need to tell you what happened and here's the story and so it is sort of put in stone in a way you know it is sort of identified early on and then you sort of have to work through it so like I think actually tackling some of these feelings in a memoir is a little bit different or a little bit just more un a little bit unique com compared to other kinds of um other kinds of art comic art yeah totally I just looked at my paper I wrote put pants on your ideas <laughs> I don't, I don't have that paper. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like preparing for the podcast. I was like, that's, that's the one. And and then I read it and I'm like, what am I saying? So. Do you want to go down the, want to go down the list? Do I don't know, know if we want to go down the pants rabbit hole be, exactly. But, well, um, and also like, we should be mindful of time. I don't think any podcast, anybody wants to be on this call. How long is our podcast? An hour? Less, I hope. But Less. All right. How about, how about 45 minutes? That gives us three minutes. <laughs> what, really? Okay. <laughs> take a question on that list and then we'll maybe take one question from the chat if there are okay. any. there weren't okay, a lot we had one from beth and i think Beth's on the call um i love every part of making comics which i was so excited to read in the comic sense of things in terms of the whole creative process it's in the early stages of a project wrangling some sense into the many too too many ideas i have that always frustrates me most. I always just want things to solidify faster so I can get to work. Order the parts of the process that feel more like work. Order the process parts of the process that feel like, you know, more solid, I guess. Um, I am not a patient person, <laughs> that said. That's, that's interesting. Um, so, so Tom, you're kind of allergic to like having a grocery list that you have to execute in a yeah. really uh, rigid way. But if you have a lot of ideas, like how do you manage the um, anxiety of like putting some structure or armature on that so that you can make some type of progress? Or like, do you do that at all? I was answering a question in the chat. Can you say that again? Sure. Um, if you have too many ideas, does that bother you? And oh, I actually, oh, sorry. Okay. I do know Beth's question. Um, and um, I actually, I, 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 I came to a point where I realized, like, I, I don't want to say I thrive in chaos, but I sort of like it. But that chaos, so that chaos of like trying to make things connect and organize ideas and having a lot of random ideas and playing around with them. Um, I think I was probably at my worst with that around 20, I don't know, 18 through 20 or something like that, where I wasn't finishing anything. I had sketchbooks and they weren't really making me feel bad. I just kept just filling up junk with starters and stuff. But eventually I, I realized I, I had to identify what what why I was feeling lousy and it was because I wasn't finishing anything. So that's when I particularly ta started tackling smaller things, one page. And um and that started to feel good. It was like, oh, I can put a couple ideas together and and let that chaos coalesce in a page, which took Three or four days to make and then take a deep breath and do it again and so like that was a rhythm where i could build up into longer slightly longer stories and then i hit that and then i sort of started doing 24 page stories i built it up to that where i was like okay i'm going to take this chaos and i actually like that chaos stage again the, the stage that beth is identifying as being frustrating and then i would play around with it and i would sort of massage it into 24 pages and then work through it and finish it and i would feel good about it I hit that, I had a block. This is the block that propelled me into music. I had a block 
when I did five of those, and then I outlined the next the next seven issues. So an, another, what's seven times twenty four? I, I can't do it really, but another one hundred and fifty sixty pages. And then I just was like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so, so like, again, it was that puffery too, right? It was like these are great ideas. Now I just gotta show the world and um and it it didn't work i might i the feelings were too bad immediately i was like no i'm gonna this is gonna not, this is not gonna be pleasant and if i'm not having a good time drawing it no one's gonna have a good time reading it so i gotta stop and i didn't know what to do so i started <laughs> was there something about like the thumbnails where you're like oh that drawing's gonna be hard to draw or the content was like too hard to sit with or like how did you know it was going to be unpleasant? it is part of that i have to admit that like i'm not a good I'm not, I'm not the artist my writer wishes he were, you know, my, the writer wishes he could hand the, the work off to somebody better than, than me. Um, but I also know that the artist can have, I also know that th there's a meeting ground between the two where they can e each have fun or they can each have a sort of creative, rewarding creative experience. And it's just tricky to find that balance every once in a while. I have to re, re, recalibrate. This is why I outsourced my writing because <laughs> I was too scared. I was like, you'll write it. And then I was like, oh, this is fun. Uh, but even then, uh, I have to negotiate with my artist. Like, I'm like, you're not very good at this. <laughs> uh, but how can we make this really, I, I invite myself to do what I feel could be the worst version in the thumbnails, like very noodly, for lack of a better word. And for some reason, that delights me. Soft soft delight not crazy like not the but i think there's something there's something very like back of the classroom tee hee hee like fart joke about it that's like oh this is so stupid like how could i be mad how could i be critical it's already so demented oh um, and, and that's yeah go, go ahead. ahead no no go ahead i was just gonna say like i don't know i don't know if that's like the best way to work but it's the only way i can make peace with um um like my inabilities as an artist is by like almost um making fun of it or or leaning into it or um this is a weird analogy but there was one time I was very very hungry and I had tater tots on a cookie sheet and they were stuck to the cookie sheet I'd taken them out of the oven they were ready to eat and I had a little spatula that was way too small I was trying to get them off the cookie sheet and they kept flying off the cookie sheet onto the floor. And embarrassingly, I did this in front of a roommate and she was like, whoa, but I I, um, I started taking the tater tots and throwing them on the ground. I was like, fine, I just, I don't even want these. <laughs> um, and she's like, wow, you're really hungry. You need to relax. Uh, so maybe that's not the best way, but but it, I think I'm, in describing the, the feeling, it was sort of like that. It was like, oh, if this isn't going to work, let me do the version that really, really doesn't work and then see that I survived and it's fine and there's something about it that's funny to me. And we can only go up from here, right? <laughs> that was like a, a better uh evolution i think the initial thought was like i'll do the bad version in the layouts and then i'll fix it later in the pencils i think more i'm like i'm committing to the bad version early so it doesn't surprise me when i get to the pencils or the inks <laughs> it's already on the page you're, com you're committing to the bad version meaning you will stick by you'll stick by the bad decisions you made or what do you mean yeah by that? like i think sometimes when we're too vague with our preliminary plans like oh, i'll just draw a stick figure and then it'll turn into like, uh, you know, a Da Vinci level artwork in, in later stages and the pencils or the inks or when I add color, it all makes sense. Uh, not putting that kind of pressure on myself, but just drawing something that's articulated so I know where everything is, but also making it very silly, like making it wrong, like intentionally, I don't know what about it's wrong, but um, the heads are too big or there's no hands. And then if there's no hands, I'm like, what if I drew the hands? like this like just exaggerating the badness of it like um but if it exists on paper then it becomes less scary it's like exposure therapy <laughs> like ah, oh, it's bad but i am still alive does that make sense tom i don't know I think that... it makes total sense i think we should pick up the second the second episode of this tomorrow or, or whenever yeah. or next, next week. week yeah with that with like, with like starting with what's bad quote bad because we're going to put that in quotes and um, uh, and exaggerating it, looking at exposure therapy, great analogy. 
um yeah yeah it's it's really it's really interesting i had a student at saw in the in the year-long program in person who had you know she brought me lumber james and a bunch of other ya books and she said i really want to do this and we kept we kept um working her over her 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 pages to sort of like get a little bit more like that a little bit more like that and it wasn't and um and she did a great job she was um but it was always a struggle and her work never really got to that level and it was only after she was gone we're still in touch so it's not like she you know <laughs> that, it, that it was hopeless and we never got a chance to, to speak but it was only after she was gone like I was cleaning up and I was looking at the work and I was like this is beautiful this is wonderful and it is so not like what she was trying to do but it, in itself it's just this this unique and 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 I I felt regret as a teacher I should have been like let's push this more the stuff you're doing and strive for lumberjanes less you know and um and it's okay like again we're in touch and she's proud of that work now but I but I realized that I was so even as a teacher I was so lost in this in the struggle to reach those ideals of hers as she was that uh that we didn't lean into the uniqueness of of it and um and man that's all you know that's all we got that's all most people got I mean you know certain people can anyway <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah, I, I, I feel like if, if, uh, like greatness is sort of like something I'm working towards, but badness just already lives inside of me. I'm like, well, how can I make my badness? Like if it's going to stick around and it's hard to get rid of, how do I make it work for me? Like, since I know that it will be there, I could count on it to be bad. I, I think we should stop there. Um, unless we somehow <laughs> miss a really, really important question, but you said great, like, Greatness is something I, I strive for. Yeah, but it's fleeting. Badness is already Maybe inside me. Badness yeah. is going to be there, yeah. So we invite you this week to be bold, be bad, <laughs> be the worst person, be the worst version of yourself. Don't get arrested, but... <laughs> right, not in that way, right? Not in the moral... Yeah, like just, a, like just to, in your art life, yeah. I'd like to think you're morally going to stay stay grounded but it's definitely true that like you know play around with those bad marks or those or those bad um ideas um okay so what's our call to arms do we have a hashtag <laughs> a hashtag aside yeah from i don't know we have to give we have to give our uh devoted audience something to choose sure on. well i think i think it is it is that it's like it's like identify in the same way that you're like oh i'm I drew a really bad hand, so I'm going to draw it really bad this comment, this this panel, and then letting yourself do that panel after panel, so it becomes a style, right? Like not not always hands, but it's just like oh, there's that that relics and wonkiness, sort of like in full flourish, right? <laughs> you know, like find that thing that that you struggle with, exaggerate it, I suppose, and um. And, and see how you can make that, a, that make that a communication device, right? This is what's really weird is when I did that and I gave myself permission to, I was like, I'm making the bad version. I'm fully committed to it. On the other side of that were gorgeous drawings. Absolutely stunning. Like I it just bloomed right off the page in the next version because I had given myself a sort of, mm -hmm. this is the low watermark. <laughs> this is where it ends. And and it, it was like uh, planting soil and stuff just started growing out of it it was the weirdest thing I've never had to happen not a guarantee though no but I <laughs> and it wasn't the reason I did it I was just like yeah well I'm just trying to cope with my own limitations so uh so join us next week on the terrible anvil where Tom and I discuss what is bad <laughs> and how, uh how can I draw more of it out of me yeah, let's bring the badness to 2024. Uh, and we probably have a hashtag. You can invent one for us and tell us what it is. Uh, and we're available on the uh, flow part of the Mighty Network if you're on uh, Saw's Mighty Network. And uh, this will also be archived somewhere very clever. And we're we'll have a that. cooler intro with hopefully featuring Tom's music next, <laughs> next time we see you. <laughs> All right. So Jess, I'll talk to you in a week. We can obviously... Uh, keep this conversation going in the network and stuff but um and thanks everybody in the chat and for contributing to that and we'll that chat is saved and we'll we'll provide that in in the network too and if anything we've missed 
um, bring that up on the in the network, and we'll we'll get to that next week. Um, Jess, thank you for for starting this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Tom. It happened. Okay, I'll see everybody next week. Have a good week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us. This has been a production of the Sequential Artists Workshop, or SAW. You can find us on social media at Comics Workshop and online at sawcomics.org. You can hear about our many courses at learn.sawcomics.org. SAW is a nonprofit and supported by people like you. Learn how to make a tax-deductible donation at the donate page of SAW.